coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I always go back to kind of the behavioral perspective for the general population. How well does this strategy scale? And my opinion and the opinion of many people I speak with about this is that early time restricted eating would be a huge challenge, um, say socially. Mm-hmm. Uh, getting up, eating breakfast, you know, eating throughout the day, cutting off mid afternoon. If you think about most people's schedules, whether it's work, um, you know, family commitment, school, you're coming home in the evening. Now you're um, having social opportunities with family or friends. You have increased access to food. You're relaxing a little bit. Um, to me, that would be a very difficult time to to not eat. It'd be much easier to not eat until mid afternoon than mm-hmm. to eat until mid afternoon and stop. So even though something like early time restricted eating might be kind of like on paper, a perfect program where you're like, okay, you have the shorter eating window, you're shifting your calories earlier in the day. Uh, this is all good. Uh, to me on the behavioral side, for most people, it might be a big challenge. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was five, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed Dr. Grant Tinsley. He's the Director of Energy Balance and Body Composition Lab at Texas Tech University, and we discussed the best ways to measure body composition, the effects of caffeine on working out, along with different types of fasting to apply to your lifestyle, tips around completing a fast, his studies around resistance training muscle with intermittent fasting. We also discussed his fasting, eating, and workout routine. This was an in-depth interview with Dr. Grant Tisley. I really enjoyed meeting him and the interview. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Dr. Grant Tinsley on. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you on. I was looking through all your research that you've done through the years, and um, I feel like this podcast could go on for a long time talking about all the different studies that you've done um, and the papers that you've written. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself and and the type of things that you research um, and just a little bit of background. Yeah, so I'm currently an associate professor at Texas Tech University uh, out in Lubbock, Texas, far out West Texas. Um, I've been here for, I guess, almost six years now, which is hard to believe. Um, Prior to coming to Texas Tech, I completed my uh, PhD in kinesiology and exercise nutrition at Baylor University. Uh, And prior to that, I completed degrees in nutritional sciences, uh, physiology, and biomedical sciences. Uh, In addition to that, uh, a lot of our work, as I'll get into in a minute, involves um, exercise. So I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist, um, as well as a, a certified sports nutritionist. Uh, in terms of my lab, we have a, a very active lab. We currently have about 11 students working in the lab, split up across undergraduates, uh, master's degree students, and doctoral students. And our lab focuses on three main areas of research. One that I think we'll be discussing today is intermittent fasting. And we have a particular focus on intermittent fasting protocols, typically in the form of time-restricted eating and applying those in active populations, uh, most commonly those performing weight training or resistance training. Beyond that, we do a lot of work with body composition assessment methods. So looking at the validity and reliability of novel devices and different ways we can uh, either make devices more accessible, say for practitioners in the field and people at home, uh, or ways we can go go in the opposite direction and make our techniques more advanced for sort of laboratory or research settings. Uh, In addition to those areas of research, we conduct a decent amount of sports nutrition research, looking at uh, dietary supplementation. Uh, for say improving uh, metabolism, exercise performance, and so on. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Yeah, I love that. And it sounds like you you really enjoy what you do. Um, it's so- like I would love to <laughs> check it out and like research that stuff for a day. And I give you I give you a ton of <clears throat> credit because the stuff that the research that you do, do can help people like myself and people that are out in the field coaching on individuals to help you know get these individuals to get optimal results. Yeah, absolutely. And as you know, we briefly discussed offline before this, it's, it's, uh, I feel fortunate to be an area of research where there is direct application to people and um, people, you know, want to talk to you about your research. I'm not, <laughs> you know, over doing something in astrophysics. It's cool, but right. it might be harder to, to translate to the general population. Yeah. And uh, one of the things you mentioned, and I, I wanted to touch on uh, first was you talked about like measuring the best ways to measure body composition. 
Uh, and I, I, something that I do with my clients is I have them do a DEXA scan. And I'm just curious from your research, what are some of the best ways to do that both maybe in the home and then at, you know, obviously at maybe at a facility with a DEXA scan. Yeah. Well, first I'll say it's imp- impressive that you're able to have your clients get a DEXA scan. That's usually, uh, you know, that that's one of the best devices we had. If, if I had to recommend a single, um, device, it would be DEXA. Um, it's very accurate. Uh, very, um, it's very helpful that it provides segmental data. Uh, if you had access to all equipment, what we do, we use DEXA as part of our, um, what we'd view as our true gold standard model, which is a multi-compartment model, uh, most typically a four compartment model. And we essentially take the best characteristics of different devices and piece that together. So we're mm-hmm. pulling some of the DEX output, um, some output from a bod pod or air displacement plethysmography to look at the volume of the body. Um, since DEX is kind of a two-dimensional image looking at the pixels. And then similarly, a body water assessment, since we have uh, more water in our body than anything else, uh, and then a calibrated body mass estimate. So using those bits and pieces, um, what we would view as our gold standard model, uh, again, kind of uses the strengths of each of these techniques and combines them into a single estimate. With all that said, um, DEXA is great. And if you're using the same um, device, the same technology across time, DEXA is definitely in the category of uh, devices that can effectively track body composition. Uh, and again, if you need segmental data, uh, that more advanced model I was talking about doesn't provide segmental estimates. So you can make an argument that um, DEXA provides more data in that regard. Uh, if we were to pivot away from the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of lab equipment down to the far other end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. uh, my most common recommendations for um, practitioners or just individuals in a um, kind of low, I say low resource setting, just in terms of access to lab equipment. Um, I think you can get really useful information with something as simpler as simple as a flexible um, measuring tape, uh, skin fold calipers and body mass. Uh, and this isn't ideal. We all know there, there are limitations to body mass, but tracking body mass under very standardized conditions. So say morning after an overnight fast, after voiding and so on, um, tracking that will be one point of information. Another point of information would be simple limb circumferences, whether that's like upper arm, uh, thigh, in addition to waist, hips. Uh, And then if you pair that with some skin folds, you can get even more information. So if you're measuring, say, upper arm circumference and getting a skin fold thickness, which is just reflecting uh, the thickness of the skin and the subcutaneous adipose tissue, uh, then you can start kind of making some inferences just based off the raw values. So not trying necessarily to generate a body fat percentage, though you could do that. Um, But even looking at a particular region saying like, okay, if my upper arm circumference is increasing and my skin fold thickness is not increasing, then you can infer that, okay, I might be experiencing some hypertrophy, some muscle growth in my upper arm without adding fat at this location. And you could view that as an encouraging sign if you're say in a, in a phase where you're trying to gain muscle. Um, So I think sometimes people can make it, um, you know, in some ways too complicated or, or kind of some of these intermediate technologies like consumer grade bioimpedance, they might, certain ones might have a little bit of merit. Um, we just conducted a study on those recently and we're analyzing the data. Um, but sometimes I think it's better to just stick with something, you know, you can measure well, you, if, if you're trained, you can measure a circumference. Well, you can measure a skin fold thickness. Well, and just looking at those raw estimates, I think you can really get a lot of information from that. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And, uh, I agree. I think sometimes just going old school, right? Just doing re- measurements around, uh, you know, the waist, the belly area, the arms, and a lot of these devices that are coming out where you, you know, like you mentioned, where like you're standing on them and they're giving you sort of maybe an, a, a body fat percentage or they're hooked up to, to your phone. You're like you mentioned, you're just still doing research on those and as far as validity and how accurate they are. Yes. Yes. And actually one side note I'll mention just because we do a lot with 3d scanning, which is just kind of an interesting technology. There are an increasing number of phone apps where you can use your phone camera um, to take anthropometrics. So if you're not able to measure your own circumferences or you Mm. want like a machine's reliability instead of a human's reliability, which uh, depending on how trained the person is, could be a good thing. Yeah. There are a number of apps now, and we're, we're looking at some of them in our current study as well, where either from kind of like a front image and a side image, or from the person actually rotating, uh, it can build a little avatar from the body and oh. produce pretty reliable circumference estimates. Um, so that's kind of a, a new method moving forward that would be uh, in some ways high tech, but some ways, you know, it's accessible in your pocket or nearly everyone's uh, pocket. So is there a certain app that you would say maybe take a look at, or you're just looking at that right now? 
Um, we're looking at that right now. One um, that we're looking at is called Me360 by a company called SizeStream. And um, we've done some work with them in the past on their, you know, kind of large, I say research grade scanner. It actually originated in the um, fashion industry. Mm. And I think they're more popular over in Europe where sort of high-end boutique stores, you can go in and get a 3D scan. Oh. And the store gets that information and can custom fit your clothes based on cool. uh, these measurements. So that's kind of where it started, but they've moved into the body composition space and then now even into the phone app. And uh, there's certainly others besides those, but that's one that we're currently looking at. Okay. Me 360. I'll check that out. That's really cool. Uh, all right. Well, on another note, let's get into some time restricted eating. <laughs> and uh, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, you hear time restricted eating, you hear intermittent fasting. Maybe you tell the audience, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying my views on the terminology and fasting are in the process of being refined. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be involved in a consensus feedback process that just started recently, I actually submitted, I think two days ago, my first round of feedback on this, but um, some great researchers in Germany are kind of collecting a bunch of the clinicians and researchers in the realm of fasting and trying to get trying to get us all to agree on terminology. Uh, you know, you have a lot of experience in this field. I'm sure you've seen um, people use one term and then you look at it in more detail and you're like, oh, you're actually talking about something else or you're using this broad term to mean something very specific. Uh, so there's certainly not current agreement. And I'm hoping with this consensus process, we'll move towards that where we can say, okay, some people might sell a bone pick, but overall, most of us have agreed on, on this. <laughs> uh, so that's the preface. But as I would currently view it, I would view intermittent fasting as um, a very broad term, not implying a specific program, but a broad term for programs that focus on when you eat, not what you eat, and programs that incur, uh, include recurring fasts that are longer than a normal overnight fast. Uh, and of course, we kind of hit a point already of the question, what is an, a normal overnight fast? Um, there are some population level data here in the US uh, showing that on average, most people eat kind of from the time they wake up till the time they go to bed. So it's been estimated that the median fasting period defined as like no caloric intake, uh, maybe only around nine hours in the United States. So, you know, again, people eating over most, most of their waking hours. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would, I view that just kind of broad concept on intermittent fasting. The three main subtypes I would, um, kind of define would be alternate day fasting, periodic fasting, and then time restricted eating. Um, and in each of these categories, there are some you know, different permutations, alternate day fasting, for example, the, the early research was pure alternate day fasting. Like the name implies it's like you eat Monday, you do not eat Tuesday, <laughs> you eat Wednesday, you know, just like it sounds. Uh, but most of the research in, in recent years has been really modified alternate day fasting where uh, you have a normal day of eating. And on the so-called fasting day, you're usually consuming a small amount of calories, about 25% of weight maintenance calories, typically as a single meal. Um, so in that sense, you kind of have after your normal day of eating, you go through a real like overnight fast, say a true fast to lunch, then you break your fast with a small meal. And then another period of fasting, say from lunch till the next ad libitum day. Um, so uh, obviously that, that could exert some divergent effects. So just point being, even within a category, as you know, there are different permutations. And I, I'm um, just, so, just on that yeah. note, that, that's sorry to interrupt you. No, I'm just, great. what is your opinion of that? Cause it just seems like it's um that's like a teaser right like i feel like if i'm going to do alternate fasting <laughs> i'm going to not fast for that day instead of having what 25 percent of my daily caloric intake in a little meal i just feel like that's just going to spur almost more hunger but wh what are your thoughts on that yeah i think i mean in the research it seemed like there was a pretty good rationale for when they added in that meal some of the early concerns were related to lean mass loss so they saw um, you know, some effects, uh, beneficial effects, as you'd expect on things like weight loss and some health markers with the pure alternate day fasting, um, but also saw, saw some loss in lean mass. So the earliest documentation I saw in this literature for why they added that meal is related to lean mass retention and, and possibly compliance. Um, you know, it's understandable that it's, it's challenging to not eat for calendar day psychologically, like, okay, today's Thursday. I'm, I'm not eating today. Sure. Um, so I, I think they're, you know, it probably comes down to the individual at that point. Like, is it easier um, to have that little meal, or is it again, like you were saying, more of a tease where it's like, you know, I'd almost rather not eat anything than just get like, you know, <laughs> right. This teaser. Uh, sorry. Um, so go, so go ahead. So you, so we got alternate day fasting, uh, time restricted eating, which is daily short-term fasts and then periodic fasting, periodic fasting. Would that be something where you're fasting for one or two days per week? 
Yes. And in, in this admittedly uh, in my categorization includes kind of a variety of programs, but typically programs with a fast of 24 hours or longer implemented um, as infrequently as once every few months or as frequently as up to a couple of days a week. Uh, and similar to alternate day fasting, there'd be programs I view as modified periodic fasting where they are allowing some calorie intake. Um, a big example would be something like the 5-2 the diet with two, um, again, sort of modified fasting days. I would also currently like group in this category things like um, eat, stop, eat, where you're having like a, a 24 hour fast, um, which again, to draw a distinction with true alternate day fasting, that doesn't mean you're not eating on a calendar day. It's like, okay, I don't eat after dinner Wednesday and then, you know, dinner Thursday, dinner to dinner. dinner Yeah. Yeah. Um, so programs like that as well. And then, as you mentioned, time restricted eating, uh, something I like about those programs is the consistency day to day. Mm -hmm. Cause anyone listening to this here is like with the alternate day fasting, the periodic fasting, there's quite a bit of variability. It's like some days you're eating completely normally. Um, other days you're, you're not eating at all or barely eating. So I think a nice thing about time restricted eating, and I think their data support this is the consistency of eating schedule each day where you just have some period, some number of hours where you're eating all your calories. You don't consume calories outside of that. And you just repeat that every day. So uh, in in my opinion, and even what we've seen in our research, I think people can adapt to that more easily than these other programs. And and when you do your research regarding fasting, you pretty much mean water fasting, or is there some leeway as far as like black coffee or unsweetened tea or things that maybe have minimal, if any calorie in them? Yeah. So in our studies, we have, we have uh, defined it purely based on calories. So if it is a zero calorie beverage, whether that's caffeinated water, um, black coffee, unsweetened tea, then, then we allow that. Okay. Um, it, it seems like from anecdote, and there may be some data to support this. I haven't looked at it recently, but that, that, um, enhances the ability of someone to complete the fast. We, we consistently received that where they're like, if I was only consuming water, this would be hard, but if I'm able to have yeah, my black coffee or um, tea or caffeinated water, uh, you know, this, this helps me get through. Yeah. I I've heard it as like fasting training wheels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, fair. Uh, you know, maybe if you're starting out, it, it's good to use those tools to help you get through the fast. I find just being that I've been fasting, uh, you know, pretty much doing time restricted feeding for so long that I could go either way. Really. I actually find too, that I have to be a little bit careful with caffeine when I'm in a fasted state because I'm pretty sensitive to it. And it's like, you you just get like, you know, throttled up. You don't want to have it too late in the day. Let's just say that. Yeah, no, I agree. I I wish I was uh, sensitive to do it. I'm very desensitized to it, but, Mm. uh, but I agree. Definitely cutting it off, say early afternoon at the latest to, you know, minimize sleep disturbances and, and things of that nature. And so, um, what has your research found regarding circadian rhythm and is, because I get this question a lot, is there like a perfect window, um, to, if you're going to consume calories as far as insulin sensitivity and, um, just a way to not affect maybe, you know, your sleep later on, or, you know, is there a certain, uh, time period that would be beneficial? Yeah. So I'll say, I'll answer this kind of in two parts. One, in terms of the actual clinical trials we've run with time restricted eating, We have not tried to target early time-restricted eating, which is sort of the form of time-restricted eating that um, kind of promotes this idea of alignment of nutrient intake with circadian rhythms. Uh, And for anyone unfamiliar with early time-restricted eating, sorry, my light's here. Mm -hmm. um, This would just be where the the eating window shifted earlier in the day. So instead of like waiting till lunch and eating from lunch till mid-evening, so be waking up, eating breakfast and eating till mid-afternoon and then cutting it off. Um, so there have been some promising results with this early time restricted eating, again, kind of combining, um, best practices from circadian rhythms, chrononutrition, um, with time restricted eating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the caveat is our, our studies have largely used kind of a traditional, more like, um, typically noon to 8 PM, um, 11 to 7 PM type window. So depending on how you look at it for, for some people, um, if they tend to eat late at night, then even that sort of normal program of eating noon to 8 PM, that could be shifting things in a little bit of a beneficial, um, direction in terms of, um, chronobiology, chrononutrition, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, the, the general consensus is that consuming more of your calories earlier in the day, um, would be better from a chrononutrition standpoint, um, based some on epidemiological research and then some on more controlled research where individuals will ingest the same meal, say in the morning, uh, or at night, and then researchers will measure their metabolic responses. And overall the responses seem more favorable earlier in the day. 
Um, but again, this is a little bit context dependent. If you're someone that tends to eat right up until bed, you're eating till 11 PM and you go on a time restricted eating program where you're cutting off at 8 PM for you, that's actually shifting earlier, right. which is in, you know, agreement with chrono nutrition principles. Um, in contrast, other, other people, um, may not find that to be the case. So we haven't targeted that specifically. My big deal in this area, I think there's actually reasonably strong, um, evidence for, uh, chrono nutrition in, in these like acute meal testing settings. But I always go back to kind of the behavioral perspective for the general population. How well does this strategy scale in my opinion and the opinion of many people I speak with about this is that early time restricted eating would be a huge challenge, um, say socially, mm -hmm. uh, getting up, eating breakfast, you know, eating throughout the day, cutting off mid afternoon. If you think about most people's schedules, whether it's work, um, you know, family commitment, school, you're coming home in the evening. Now you're um, having social opportunities with family or friends. You have increased access to food. You're relaxing a little bit. Um, to me, that would be a very difficult time to, to not eat. It'd be much easier to not eat until mid afternoon than mm -hmm. to eat until mid afternoon and stop. So even though something like early time restricted eating might be kind of like on paper, a perfect program where you're like, okay, you have the shorter eating window, you're shifting your calories earlier in the day. Uh, this is all good. Uh, to me on the behavioral side for most people, it might be a big challenge. Yeah, I totally agree. And I always say the best program as far as timing regarding when you're going to fast or, or when you're going to feast is based on what fits best for your schedule and how you can do it consistently over time. I always just say two rolls of thumb. And I don't know what your thoughts on this was don't eat right when you get up. Uh, cause you have that spike in cortisol and you just want to give your body time to, to wake up and don't eat right close to bedtime, give yourself a few hours before you go to bed. Other than those rules of thumb, I think that there's a lot of sort of, it's not so black and white. There's some gray area as far as like what is best for your schedule. Yeah. And I'd agree, especially with, especially with the second one, I think, um, you know, I, at the individual level, it seems like there's quite a bit of variability on how easily sleep can get disturbed, but yeah, I think there is some evidence for, for not eating for several hours before bed. Um, and then, you know, personal preferences and scheduling all that I probably defer to those factors on the breakfast that, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't necessarily, if it's causing someone to like lose an hour of sleep to get up an hour earlier so that mm -hmm. they can kind of be awake and all this before breakfast, you know, then you might have to weigh the pros and cons, but yeah, right. perfect world. I, I, yeah. Wouldn't, yeah. Wouldn't take issue with either of those recommendations. Okay, cool. And I know you do a lot of uh, research regarding time restricted feeding and resistance training. And those are big areas that just for my own good, I, I, I always try to optimize those two areas and see what work, works best. And I'm curious too, about your opinion about some fasted workouts and things like that. What would be best for muscle retention and hypertrophy? Um, I guess what, what have you learned through your research, uh, regarding those, um, two issues? Yeah. So we have conducted, I believe it's up to five studies looking at resistance training in combination with time restricted eating, um, kind of across different activity levels, everything from recreationally active up to highly trained individuals, uh, many of whom identified as like natural bodybuilders. Um, so we've seen kind of a full spectrum there. We've done studies in males and females. Um, one caveat related to your question, since you must, uh, mentioned fasted training, all of our studies have placed the training window within the feeding mm -hmm. window. Um, so that was to kind of, you know, stick to tr traditional current best practices for say sports nutrition of pre-exercise fueling post-exercise recovery. Um, with that said, I'm aware of one study, which unfortunately got derailed by COVID, but I believe is up and running again, that was actually looking at different time restricted eating programs, um, with the resistance training, either in the fasted state or in the fed state to really tease this out. Cause that there has not been a direct comparison there to my knowledge. And, um, Dr. Andy Galpin out in California is the one who was running that. And, um, again, out, they, they were shut down for longer out in California than we were, um, say here in Texas on the, on the data collection. So in our studies, again, with the caveat that this, the training was within the feeding window, um, we have not seen any detriment to the improvements in muscle performance, um, muscle size, overall fat-free mass, uh, when individuals are adhering to a time-restricted eating program of a short, uh, as short as about seven and a half hours a day, um, as compared to a control group that is consuming breakfast and eating calories over about 13 hours per day. Um, so again, in, in most of these studies, uh, including the most recent one we did here, we bring all participants in for supervised training. So we have our, our 
trainers walking them through our trainers are blinded to whether someone's in the fasting group or not. Mm. Um, they're taking them through this program, encouraging them, making sure they're on a structured program, progressing the way they should. Uh, and again, with a similar overall calorie intake, uh, similar protein intake, we saw, um, equivalent improvements in, in muscular strength, muscular endurance, force production, uh, again, fat-free mass, uh, muscle, actual muscle thickness, like measuring with ultrasound specific muscle groups. Um, and then, uh, depending on the study have seen, uh, fat loss in some studies. So the last one here is pretty interesting. The, the mean changes in body mass were, were zero in the two different time restricted feeding groups. Um, but that it increased in fat-free mass and a decrease in fat mass. Uh, whereas the control group had a slight increase in body mass, um, as well as fat-free mass. Uh, there was one study looking more specifically at implementing like a similar calorie deficit with time restricted eating, uh, in a traditional meal pattern, including breakfast consumption. Uh, and there, there was no uh, difference when the calories were equated. There was a similar amount over, over a short period. This was a shorter four week study, but, um, similar weight and fat loss in both those groups. So, um, overall, I'd be very comfortable saying programs with as short as a, say seven, approximately seven hour eating window, um, definitely don't necessarily compromise in any way increases in, in lean mass and muscle performance. If say protein intake is, is sufficient and they're following a kind of well-structured evidence-based resistance training plan. And when you do these studies, there's obviously that takes some time, right? And you got to really have a control group and make sure that all the variables are like in order, right? I mean, what, what is, what is like the resources and, and the time that it takes to do stuff like this? It, it is very resource intensive. <laughs> there's, there's a reason why we have other areas of uh, research. If, if these were the only studies we did, it would just be, uh, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be as productive as we need to be, but, uh, yeah, it's very resource intensive, especially on the personnel. Um, some of these studies we've had funding for some, we've just really self-funded, you know, like pay for supplies out of general lab funds. Um, sure. the, the, really the biggest costs are on personnel's time. So, I mean, all the trainers, um, meeting with participants to ensure that they, they understand and are following the program. Um, we, we track a, a bunch of different things. So like in our last one, we were tracking, um, accelerometry. So they, you know, different points in the study, we were tracking all their movements to see if there were like spontaneous changes and in, in how much they move throughout the day. Um, collecting dietary records, uh, the actual in-lab assessment. So all these body composition assessment methods we we're talking about before, we're running all those mm. at the beginning of the study, usually the middle of the study and the end of the study. Um, so yeah, it, it's very intensive. It's it's rewarding when it's done, but um, sometimes during the data collection, collection, it can feel a little crushing. It's just so, so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it's nice then again, rewarding then that people are interested in the results and they can hopefully benefit from them. Yeah, and uh, I know you had a, I don't know how recent it was, it might've been in, in 2021, but you did, um, the effects of caffeine versus non-caffeinated mm. pre-workout supplements. That one caught my eye because I've never been a big, big pre-workout person. Um, but I, I have been leaning towards doing, um, some caffeine before a workout or even some, just a really clean supplement before, um, some pre-workout before I, I get into maybe some amino acids and things like that. What are your thoughts on, 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 you know, caffeinated versus non-caffeinated? Yeah. So we'll say, I'll say the study's under review. I'm, I'm hoping to receive a decision on it any, any day. Um, I'll give you the results, but then I'll give you kind of a, a major uh, caveat. So uh, one reason we wanted to conduct this study is because it, it's often thought that pre-workouts are if effective, only effective because of the caffeine. It's like there's caffeine, which is what matters. It'll get people, you know, it's a stimulant. Um, we'll get people feeling more energetic. They'll perform better in the gym. Um, there's pretty good research on caffeine and exercise performance kind of across different types of exercise. But the a common view is that all other ingredients are just kind of junk that's thrown in there for marketing purposes. And right. there's, there's probably some truth to that, but there are a, a small number of other ingredients with some evidence um, of potentially being effective. So what we liked is that this particular manufacturer has a essentially identical pre-workout, one that's caffeinated and one that's non-caffeinated. Mm, uh, and it's generally so. kind of an evidence-based formula in terms of the ingredients and the dosages. Um, so we were really excited about this because we thought, you know, with the same manufacturer, the same sourcing of materials, all these miscellaneous factors you have to think about. Um, with all of that controlled, we can really tease out caffeinated versus non-caffeinated. Um, so the caveats here is that this was a blinded study. So participants were receiving either placebo, the caffeinated or non-caffeinated, um, and they performed each of those conditions in a random order. 
Um, but if you like pause for a second and think about the real world effects, if you're say talking about someone, uh, maybe not someone like yourself, but someone who's, who's fully bought in on pre-workouts, like, yeah, I need my pre-workout. I have to have it when I go to the gym, if they open up that tub and look in and it's empty and they're like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and they go to the gym, they, their performance very well, uh, very it's likely would be affected. Thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So here in the lab, we, we try to take that away by having the placebo. We have the trainers who are blinded. So the trainers don't know, you know, which supplement someone has ingested. Mm-hmm. They're yelling at them. They're encouraging like push, 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 you know, all this on our devices, on all our tests. Um, so that's good from a research control standpoint, but it limits the generalizability um, because it, it takes out kind of that psychological component. So again, depending mm-hmm. on what, you know, it's viewed as good from a research perspective, but a consumer could say like, well, you know, I know whether or not I've taken pre-workout. I'm not, my roommate's not giving me some, you know, liquid and not telling me if this is right. placebo or not. Um, with all that said, what I can share at this point is it wasn't, um, we didn't see benefits across all exercise performance metrics, but we did see some improvements actually with both pre-workout supplements on lower body force production. Um, so we, the only differences that really clearly emerged with the caffeinated versus non-caffeinated were related to subjective, um, feelings of energy. So, uh, right. you know, even though this, this was blinded in terms of the administration, it's a little hard since caffeine does exert effects in your body. Right. Um, you know, the subjectives kind of confirm that at least some of the participants were feeling that, um, I will give the caveat that we've run studies before where, uh, after the study, after it's all done and I'm blind, a participant will come back and like, Oh, can you tell me what, what supplement I took in this one condition? Cause I felt so good that day. And like we <laughs> check back our records and it's like the placebo supplement. So oh. it's just flavored water. Uh, yeah. That's so crazy. Anyway, lots yeah. of interesting psychological uh, things going on. Do you have an opinion on pre-workout? Like just in general, like, what you know, and, and also obviously like something like creatine, which gets, re- which has a ton of research out there regarding it. Um, any thoughts on like that or BCAAs or any, any, yeah. So I, I would say the category of pre-workout is probably too broad for me to give like a, a categorical <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. So I'd say, I think there are some supplements that have generally evidence-based ingredients and dosages. Um, I think we're seeing a, a good push in the, the kind of sports supplement industry towards transparency where yeah. um, the actual dosages of each ingredients are listed. I'd be very wary of anything with a proprietary blend. Um, mm-hmm. so it's saying, you know, it's 15 grams of these 20 ingredients combined, but we're not telling you how much of each, right. There's no way, um, one, there's often a lot of junk in there. You don't need, and there's no way to know if you're getting an evidence-based dose of, um, the ingredients in there. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't want to make broad too too sweeping of statements, but I'd say there are some, I would be comfortable recommending if they're third party certified again, no proprietary blends, um, evidence-based ingredients and dosages, um, but I'd say probably the majority, if I had to tally it up, probably the majority would be in the do not recommend um, <laughs> category. Um, BCAAs, I, there are, from my view of the literature, there are some very isolated benefits in some contexts related to maybe muscle recovery, muscle damage or soreness. But typically in context, again, getting back to this idea of laboratory environment, environment versus real world, um, kind of environments where they're being compared to nothing. Uh, it's not like they're being compared to protein or whole foods or something, you know, people might be right. eating otherwise. So generally I would put those in the, the do not recommend category. If someone's consuming um, sufficient protein and high quality protein, uh, if someone does want an amino acid supplement, I would push more towards an essential amino acid supplement, which would include the BCAAs, but also right. all the other essential amino acids. Yeah, I know. I know uh, uh, leucine. Uh, is it leucine or am I thinking, am I, yeah, yeah. Leucine is, is, has found to be, um, helpful in strength gains. Um, and that's obviously you can get that from eggs. Right. Um, and even just a simple whey protein. What about your routine? What is your, what is your routine as far as working out and fasting? And, um, you know, I mean, I know you're a researcher and you do a lot of this, I'm sure it maybe plays a role in how you, how, how it affects what you do with your routine. Yeah, no, it's a, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chat about that. It does. Yeah. It does affect it. When I very first got into intermittent fasting research um, as a PhD student, at that point, I was very much a like, couldn't mi- miss breakfast, uh, maintained a high meal fr- frequency throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I got interested in this area, I'm like, okay, yeah, I need, I need the, I need to see what this feels like I need to do this. So right. um, yeah, I really like time restricted eating programs. I've, I've adhered to those for the most part over the last, oh, I guess, probably eight years or so. Um, with some variability, if I, if I was in a phase where I was trying to gain, um, muscle, gain weight, gain strength, I might be more liberal with the feeding window or even have it, you know, potentially unrestricted for periods of time. 
Um, and then I might get more aggressive with implementing a little bit, not long fast, but longer fast of up to 24 hours in, in periods, whereas um, trying to maintain a calorie deficit and um, finding those longer fasting periods were beneficial for that. So I'd say current day to day, I've probably eaten a seven to nine hour period of time um, starting in the Two early meals? afternoon. Two meals? Uh, usually more. So I usually target at least four doses of protein that are high enough to, to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So this would be up in for my body mass in the you know 30 grams or so range. 30 um, grams per meal. Yeah, a, mi a minimum. Usually it ends up being more than that. Um, but yeah. yeah, minimum per meal because that's kind of the um, dose corresponding to maximal stimulation of muscle and, protein synthesis. And and the reason you're doing four times is, and I believe there's some research done by, do you know, Dr. Stuart Phillips? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I, I've, I follow some of his, um, research and I think there's some research regarding, is it four, four times is like, I guess would be like the max as far as muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. Yeah. So it is interesting. I, I think there are a few things in EBTs out. So, but there, there are, there seems to be a limit where like, even if you were constantly infusing someone with <laughs> amino acids that should stimulate muscle protein synthesis at some point, it'll right. become, it'll drop even, even if you have all the amino acids there. So yeah, there, there definitely is research support for the idea that like a stimulation and like coming down off that stimulation, stimulation, uh, again, talking about muscle protein synthesis and yeah, four seems to be in the evidence-based range. Uh, even the last study we did here in resistance trained females with those, um, you know, really good results with a seven to eight hour, uh, time restricted eating program, they were getting about uh, three and a half or four meals on average a day. And part of that was because we were supplementing them with whey protein right after, um, their training. Um, so yeah, I'll typically weekdays just schedule what works for me is I don't, I don't like bringing and preparing food. So usually the first, um, feeding or two, like here in the afternoon will be something like. Um, one of the high protein, like fair life, ultra filtered milk. So essentially be protein only like through the first couple meals. And I'll go home and enjoy like a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, you know, carbohydrates, fast protein, everything, a normal meal, a large normal meal. And then another, um, usually protein centric, but also include, you know, other, um, particularly fruits and vegetables, uh, in kind of like a final meal in the mid evening. So like I probably push my final eating time, uh, a hair later than I used to just cause that, uh, on a weekday with the schedule of, um, the job and family life and all that, it's, it's what tends to work. Um, now I typically open up the feeding window again for, for like scheduling family related reasons. I usually open that up a little more on weekends. Um, cause I'm, I'm making protein pancakes for the kids and mm -hmm. I want to enjoy those also. So I'll usually have that window open more and I try not to, um, you know, go overboard or binge eat or change my food choices too much, but I just open up the feeding window. Cause on those days at home, uh, it, it's more agreeable. So again, it's very on the behavioral focus. Um, in terms of training, I'm fortunate enough to, I live out in West Texas, had a lot of room. So I recently built a big I metal building that. in my backyard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have a home gym there. I, I primarily perform resistance training. I'll do, uh, most of my, uh, low intensity cardio will be like walks running in the yard with the kids playing. I'll do some jump rope and biking, but, right. um, for the most part, I do resistance training, kind of a mix of, of powerlifting and bodybuilding style, just cause, um, it's just what I love. It's what got me into to exercise in the first place. So um, I'll usually do that four days a week or so. And then I'll, I'll keep continue. I'll give you the whole program on, on supplements. You mentioned creatine. I definitely take creatine monohydrate daily. I think it's great. Um, people have different views on multivitamins, but I take a, take a multivitamin, take fish oil, um, often supplemental vitamin D and zinc, uh, particularly through the winter. Um, I have been, uh, and then I take a, typically a pre-workout supplement. I'll have my caffeine in the morning. Um, and Is then I'll take a non-caffeinated pre-workout supplement because I train in the evening and I, like we were talking oh, about, don't want okay. sleep disturbances or anything. Oh, so you nature. do your training in the evening? I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, kind of late afternoon. Usually, uh, the kids are doing their training, running around, picking up dumbbells, throwing them around and, and I'm doing my training as well. You know, I, yeah, I follow you on Instagram. I saw your, how, do you have a son that's how old? Uh, he's four. And he did a, he just picked up a kettle, but I saw that he picked up a kettlebell and just did a like perfect form on a deadlift. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a very proud father moment. Yeah. He was yeah. At, at 41 pounds ripped to this 53 pound kettlebell off the ground. And I was cheering for him. He did it once. And I'm like, wait, 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 dude, let me grab my phone out. I'm like, okay, take a little rest period. And then I want to see if you can do it again. So <laughs> did he do um, it again? He did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he did. Yeah. He had like, yeah, I saw that. And, um, that's cool. I saw your gym. So, so typically your day, you'll break your fast, like, let's say what, two o'clock ish, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. In the noon to two range, depending you'll, on the day. And yeah. you'll have something more on the protein fat side it, it, to break the fast. And then, um, you'll work out 
and then you'll sort of backload your carbs. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. I essentially do. And it's, um, pseudo intentional. It's not for like a, a great performance reason. And I'll give the caveat that if I have a day where I'm trying to hit heavy deadlifts, heavy squats, something like that, I'll either have like a pre-exercise snack. That's like more carbohydrate focused, or I'll put those on those weekend days where my feeding windows already opened up and I'll have had more kind of pre-workout nutrition just because I, I feel I can get through most of my workouts fine in a pseudo facet or like say only having had protein state. Um, but squats and deadlifts, I, I, I cannot get the performance I want. So I just kind of tailor it based on that. But if it, if it's more accessory work or upper body work, um, it, it doesn't feel as challenging, even in a kind of protein sparing, modified fasted type state. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I love hearing other individuals routines. I mean, I try to tweak mine and make it, I I've been in this rhythm of being in a fasted state when I work out and just breaking it when I'm done. And I've tried the other way. I, and, and I, I'm curious to see if it, it, you know, my workouts though, I I've changed it. I used to be like sort of old school in the sense, hour, hour and a half in there. Now it's like 30 minutes <laughs> yeah. and I'm like done. So it's almost like a little bit of a micro workout, but, it, um, it's just the more it, guys, not, not just guys, the more women or men I interview that are, um, study this stuff is just like these micro workouts, I think run true as far as effectiveness. Um, yeah, I don't think you necessarily need to spend hours in the gym to, to, to get, you know, to get the gains. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And similar, I've seen a similar progression, some for practical reasons, but also, yeah, kind of, um, you know, cost benefit analysis that it's like, yeah, sitting at 30, 40, 45 minutes, um, you know, you can get the majority of the benefits, uh, depending on the style, if you're a power lifter and you're needing to take three to five minute rests between every right. set, it, it may get pushed out longer, but if you're trying to get in, get your work done, get out. I, yeah, I completely agree that duration can work. Are you, you've probably talked to your listeners more, so you can don't, you don't have to answer no, this question, but yeah. I'm curious to hear about your program. Like you mentioned, it's nice to talk to others and kind of see what, what they do. Yeah. So, well, my program typically is, um, I I'm in a facet state from, I try to cut off my eating time around six 30. 637. So my, I, my wife and I eat for on the early side with early bird special. <laughs> it's like, we, we did a trip to California and we had these reservations, you know, you're, you're on vacation, you're like, Oh, we'll, we'll put it for like seven thirty seven. And every time I think every day at in the middle of the day, we're like, let's just call the restaurant and move up our time. And it, it you know, I, we just enjoy eating early. So we eat early. Um, I'm usually done eating around six thirty seven, Um, and then I'm in a fasted state. Um, I do all my work and stuff, try to get all done in the morning. So I'm done around like two, three o'clock and then I'll work out. And then to my workouts, which like I mentioned to you used to be more traditional. Now I had, uh, Dr. John Jaquish on my podcast a couple of times with the X3 bar. And, uh, I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, it's, it's variable resistance with, and I'm, I'd be curious to see if you ever do a study on that, but variable resistance versus traditional lifts. Um, um, have you, have you ever done any studies on that? I haven't, I, and I haven't actually even used it. I'm, I'm generally aware of it, but, um, okay. yeah, but you enjoy that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, how old are you? <laughs> uh, I'm 31, 31. Okay. So I got 10 years. I do. <laughs> I'm 41. Um, so, uh, I just found, the uh, the band training, um, it comes with, it's like an Olympic bar. There's a ground plate and I've just done more with bands because the variable variable resistance, it's just easier on my joints. And I've been able to do, there's a, there's an exercise. And if you check out my Instagram, you'll see it, but I uh, I'll do like a front squat with it. And it's a lot safer than holding, you know, the, having an actual traditional, um, um, you know, bar with the weights it's, 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 it, and, uh, front squats are just, I, I don't know if you do them, but they're just <laughs> the toughest things to do. And so I do, I, I do a lot of, uh, I do upper body, lower body splits, um, just getting back in my routine. And then, um, I'll break my fast, um, uh, after that usually, so I, I don't like to, uh, I usually do like eggs, eggs and some, um, maybe avocado and eggs or lox and eggs or something like that to break my fast. And then I'll have one more meal. So I usually do two meals, um, per day. And if I'm going to have carbs, I typically have it in that second meal. Okay. So is it total then of about like a four hour eating period from when you're first breaking your fast till you're done at six 30? I would say on average, yeah, four to okay. five, four to five hours, which, yeah. you know, t and, and like you mentioned, you, you have almost like three to four separate meals. Sometimes I think I'm, am I getting enough protein? I almost feel like 
I'm probably in some type of calorie deficit, but I, I, I do try to keep my protein up and I eat till I say, until I'm satisfied. So it's like, I don't, I don't feel like I need to keep eating just to eat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I think that's a great perspective. And then today it's like, you're doing something that you can continue to do that you enjoy doing, getting the results you want. It's like, you can't, you know, can't argue too much with that. You know, talk, speaking of DEXA scans, and one of the things you mentioned that you like about them is the segmental measurements that it takes. Cause it literally would take like your, your left leg, your right leg, right? Like, yeah. so is that what you were saying that you really like yeah. about it? How it really gets exact? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, one of the things I noticed is I, is I'm wondering with myself is I'll do it every six months or so is, um, I have been able to put on some muscle. My weight has probably been about the same. I'm probably about one between 170 and 175. But what I notice, especially with doing those front squats, um, my legs have gotten <laughs> just bigger. Like I can tell, I mean, I, I the DEXA scan tells it too, but so that's always a, a good feeling. Cause I know you're, I've seen you do deadlifts and those are some tough deadlifts that you do. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, I agree though. Front squats are the kind of the worst. Uh, I mean, great yeah. exercise, but yeah, psychologically, yeah, very challenging. Yeah. So I'd be curious to see, uh, uh, I know you got your home gym, but maybe, uh, try some variable resistance with, with bands. It doesn't even have to be the X three, but you might, you might like it on, on, on maybe not all the exercises that you do, but just to mix it up, um, with, uh, with presses. Cause I used to have like elbow issues when I used to do just traditional bench press. I feel like that's for like the younger people. <laughs> like maybe when I was in my twenties, I'm able to do bench, but now I'll do it with the, with the band. And there's an Olympic bar too, which is nice. It's, it's a little bit of a narrow grip, but, um, I just don't have those elbow issues anymore, which is nice. So, yeah, no, I'll definitely look into, I'm always looking to expand what we have uh, available in the, the shop gym. Yeah. And I saw, I saw the gym you built. That's, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, oh, thank you. And so, and that, what about just to turn the page a little bit, let's talk a little bit about, um, your recent, uh, paper that I have, if you're watching on YouTube, here we go. And so this was, I, I read this whole thing. Uh, I don't know how many pages it was, but probably 10 pages, which is a lot for me to read. <laughs> uh, but I found it interesting and we're not going to obviously touch on every single thing. We've already talked about a bit of it, but what would you say, like a conclusion that you came from it that maybe you, you, you didn't have before um, you did this study? Yeah. So I'd say the biggest thing, uh, yeah, just for any listeners, this was a review article we published in nutrition reviews recently looking at, um, kind of acute changes in different physiological markers over the course of a fast. So we we're trying to tease out like what's happening after an overnight fast, what's happening at 16 hours of fasting, 20 hours of fasting, 24 and so on. Um, because there've been a number of trials and a lot of interest of course, in intermittent fasting, kind of the long-term results of these programs. Um, and that's great, but we wanted to kind of back up and say like, okay, we know different things happen across different durations of fasting. And maybe that should inform our choice of how we put together an intermittent fasting program. Um, so, you know, with the caveats that of course, we'll always come back to kind of the behavioral aspects and adherence and all this, but say you're someone um, like yourself, Brian, who, who can do well with fasting. It's like, you can, you fast 20 hours daily. You could extend that. I'm sure if you wanted to. Um, is there evidence we have to kind of inform what duration of fasting might give you the most bang for your bucks, so to speak. Uh, so I guess one takeaway that's interesting, again, this isn't to um, rail against, you know, like common implementations of time restricted eating, like the eight hour eating window and 16 hours of fasting. Um, but it, it is very possible that cutting off a fast at like 16 hours, you may, may be missing out on periods where, um, physiologically there's some greater shifts and things like carbohydrate and lipid metabolism, um, and again, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't base all our decisions just on these acute physiological changes, but as someone progresses up to 20, 24 hours of fasting, there are a number of events going on, um, such as the depletion of liver glycogen that's progressive throughout a fast, but by 20 to 24 hours, nearly all the liver glycogen is depleted. Um, that's one of many signals that, that will influence carbohydrate and lipid metabolism, uh, there's a very large increase in, in lipolysis or, or breaking down fat as well as fat oxidation. Um, as you get up closer to like 18, 20 into 24 hours, that kind of range from 18 to 24 in some of the studies is where they saw the biggest increase, um, in lipid metabolism over the course of a whole 72 hour fast. So if they're looking at all the time periods over 72 hour fast, 
um, that was kind of a, a, a critical period. And again, we can't infer too much from this. We can't say for sure that it's like, oh, if you're doing 16 hour fast, you're going to get no results. You have to be doing 24 hour fast <laughs> or anything of that nature. But just to say there are physiological changes occurring in the body um, that might help us inform our duration of fasting. Uh, so we kind of hope this would help maybe not only practitioners, but even researchers, instead of just rinsing and repeating the same fasting programs to kind of consider and say like, okay, is there a specific health outcome we're targeting with this study? Is it some, you know, insulin sensitivity based on these acute changes? Is there a duration of fast we should be using that might be better than just, you know, the standard programs everyone's used. So that, that'll be my best attempt at a, at a big picture summary. Yeah. No, I love, I love this study because this is something I think about a lot just for my own good. Um, I started doing, you know, all you have all these wearables, right? I got a, I got a CGM. I don't go, I try not to go crazy with all these wearables. I've, I've worn some sleep ones as well, but, um, one of one that I started to do was, uh, measuring ketones. And I was like, Hey, you know, I wonder, cause you know, I'm fairly low carb and fasting a decent amount, you know, am I getting in ketosis? And so, um, I had, uh, Ben Azadi on, he's like a big keto guy. He's like, Oh, check out uh, keto mojo. Um, I don't have any affiliation with them, but I was like, all right, I'll check them out. And so I started doing it. And I noticed like my ketone levels weren't crazy. And actually the only time they were somewhat impactful was actually after I was probably in about a 20 hour fast. Um, and it's interesting that you say that, that my body then started to utilize fat for energy. Um, is this something that you've ever measured on you or, you know, um, infrequently, uh, infrequently, occasionally I have though, I similar to what you're mentioning. And even from the daily schedule, I, I, um, you know, just described, I'm a little on the shorter end. There is some data and we discussed this in the paper where, uh, ketone bodies may start to increase after, you know, shortly after overnight fast, but not to a very large extent up until you're at, like you mentioned that 20 into 24 hours and beyond, then you're seeing kind of a larger increase, um, say around that 20 hour mark. Um, so I, I have sparingly, but based on the durations of fast, I most typically use, um, I haven't seen a, a ton of merit in it. Um, again, like, like you're saying, it might just be cutting off a little short of that period where that would be more detectable. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, it's, it's a self-experimentation thing, right? Like you said, it's tough to make this blanket statement because like my wife, for example, who eats about the same way I do, uh, her ketones were like rocking and rolling earlier on. So I was like jealous. I'm like, God, we were like comparing ketone levels. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, a normal thing people do, right? Yeah. No, I would assume most households do that. Um, so I was, yeah, I was like jealous. I'm like, all right, whatever. But um, either way, it's just interesting. I think that's why these wearables and, and these different tests are cool, I think, to some degree. But on the other hand, you have to almost just go off how you're feeling and like what works best for you. So I'm not like getting all, you know, caught up in that. Um, one other question would be like, what, what did you learn from maybe extended fasts? Cause this is something I think about occasionally I'll do it where I'll just, you know, go, let's just say a couple days, uh, you know, go overnight fasted and I'll just do, I won't do that too often, but every maybe like few months I'll do that where I'll do maybe a two, two day, three day fast. Um, was there any research behind that? And, and as far as, you know, um, even autophagy and cell cleansing? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have not conducted like trials in our own lab, looking at fast longer than 24 hours. So we've okay. done some studies with 24 hour fasting, um, from the literature view we're describing there, the durations longer at like 48, 72 hours are relatively well characterized in, um, older research. So looking at big picture things like glucose and insulin concentration, um, lipid kinetics, kind of what we we're describing with, with lipolysis and fat oxidation. Right. Um, the interest in autophagy seems to be more recent and I haven't seen a lot in that extended fasting period, though. I think it's reasonable to assume the longer the fast, the, the higher, the likelihood based on kind of the, um, molecular underpinning, so to speak, you know, what's mm -hmm. actually stimulating this, um, I feel like I might've forgotten part of your, your, no, that's okay. Here. I mean, I had Dr. Jason Fung on here <clears throat> and okay, there, yeah. there's, <clears throat> Excuse me. There's no way to measure autophagy, really. So it's sort of, I know that question is, is a tough one to answer. <clears throat> but I was just curious if you did anything past 24 hours. And, and it sounds like from, from this recent paper, it was just up to about 24 hours as far as, you know, lipid metabolism and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in our own studies up to 24 hours. And then, yeah, this, this um, 
review we went up to 96 hours in terms of the studies we considered. And uh, yeah, you're right. The measurement of autophagy is challenging. We, th there are some markers or components of the pathway you can measure, but, uh, and we kind of discussed this in the paper, it's far from well characterized in humans uh, and their challenges kind of, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is what I was thinking of with the pattern you described of the longer fast every so often. Um, you know, there, there's some rodent data um, supporting that. There are some human programs that are sort of similar to that. The one that comes to mind is like the fasting mimicking diet where it might be a five day period or so. And it, it's not truly fasting, but you're trying to mimic a fasting state. It's low calorie, you know, like certain selections of macronutrients and so on. Um, but I think that did arise out of some rodent research showing even just very, you know, occasion, like every few months, a, a longer fast of several days could have profound effects. Now, caveat is that a um, you know, two day fast in a rodent is not the same as a two day fast right. in a human because of differences in metabolism and so on. So, uh, yeah, definitely so some challenges in translation, uh, an interesting area for research though. Again, I would say thinking about the generalizability, there are some people again, like yourself, um, uh, and I guess myself to some extent who, who can have, and can push into longer fast as desired sure. uh, and don't have too much of a problem with that. And there are others who, uh, you know, in our 24 hour fasting studies, it was actually interesting. A number of the participants were like, and rightfully so very, very proud of themselves. They're like, when I enrolled in the study, I didn't actually think I could do this. I didn't think it was possible to not eat for 24 hours. Um, but they did it and they, they felt this great sense of accomplishment, which is kind of a side note. So, you know, people can, can do more than, than sometimes they realize they can in that, that realm. But there's some people who probably wouldn't like a, a two day fast. That's like just never something I'm going to attempt. Right. And I always say, <clears throat> I, obviously lost my voice or you might have to take over the podcast. No. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that, <clears throat> and I ran out of water too, which was good. Um, yeah. I would say that it's like fasting is like a muscle, right? You just got to build it and it's not something you want to overdo because it is a stressor. Now on that note, are there any other hormetic stressors that you do for yourself or that you would, uh, that, you know, you sort of implement into your routine? Uh, not systematically or intentionally. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Not, not, okay. not really beyond. Okay. Yeah. Like exercise and, and fasting and, uh, you know, just, um, surviving unlimited sleep due to, uh, family life things that no, no, no other okay. intentional ones. All right. Well, we'll have to do a part two. Cause I know we can keep going on and on. Um, and maybe in that part two, I know you have your, uh, that your big workout, uh, faci facility that you built for yourself. You got to put a plunger in there, uh, do some cold plunging. I highly recommend it. Uh, I think it'll just up your recovery up your, you know, up inflammation energy. I think it's something maybe, especially cause you got that perfect spot and you know, I don't know where you built that in your backyard or whatever, but I would add a plunger as be my advice. So, yeah, I'm definitely, there's some empty space. We built it bigger than the amount of stuff we had. So we will, yeah, I'll continually be looking for, for ways to enhance it. <laughs> um, all right. Well, where's the best place <clears throat> to find you? I know you got a bunch of articles on PubMed, um, but where's the best place for people to, to see your research? Yeah, probably easiest way to connect is um, Instagram. When we post new uh, or when we publish new articles, I usually post about it there. So uh, my handle there is just grant underscore Tinsley underscore PhD. Uh, if you want more direct links out to all my research, I have a personal website, which is just granttinsley.com. Um, so I have links to, to PubMed and um, other sites that, that house our research articles. I have pictures of our lab, uh, description of our lab team, uh, a, a detailed article about our garage gym, uh, all that type of information. So those would probably be the two best places to connect. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do a part two, uh, down the road, maybe when you have some, another cool research study that's come out and you feel like it'd be great and advantageous for people to hear that, because, you know, like we said in the beginning, I love connecting with you because you sort of tie together a lot of the things that maybe I talk about with clients or that you hear that they hear on the podcast, but you're really doing the research behind it. So I, I appreciate that. So Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the kind words. I'd be, I'd be happy to come on again. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.